This steel box that you see everywhere, on ships, on roads and on rail, is bringing all of our manufactured goods around the world. Prior to the introduction of the standard shipping container, maritime trade and the handling of cargo looked very different. It involved a lot more manpower and it was a very time-consuming affair. Also, not very efficient. The container was introduced in the 1950s and in a sense the world has never looked back since. Today almost everything is shipped in a container but how is it this came to pass and what was it like before? I visited the Danish Maritime Museum located right next to the historic Kumbo Castle to have a talk with Torpion about how they show their guests the evolution of maritime trade and everything else a life at sea entails. The maritime world is an extremely diverse world. That's also what we're trying to uh, communicate in our museum. Mm. That we're not just a museum about ships, we're very much a museum about uh, people, emotions, technology, consumption, goods, and art as well. Um, also one of the reasons our exhibit, we try to make our exhibitions quite, quite diverse mm -hmm. and uh, to show people that the maritime sector is not just, even though it's important, it's not mm. just about transporting things from A to B, no. it's also a state of mind mm. and a state of dreams. This is uh, the exhibition about the port, Gate to the World, and uh, a port, it was originally made for goods, obviously, but it's also a place for people, where people, they work, and uh, people, they live, and people, they entertain themselves, and people, they welcome each other, and uh, say goodbye to each other. And especially uh, if you go back a hundred years, it was also a place of souvenirs mm. because uh, sailors from from Denmark, for instance, they brought souvenirs from all over the world. And if you go back a hundred years, you couldn't just fly somewhere. You had to sail and mm. it was mostly sailors sailing. Mm. So they would become quite special people because they, they could decorate their bodies with tattoos or cloth and they could give these items to their families as well, and then they could decorate their homes mm. with items from everywhere in the world. We stop at the exhibition A Gate to the World to dive a little deeper into the topic of what characterized the port before the introduction of the container. So right now we're in the part of your exhibition which is called Gate to the World, and it's about how port operation used to be handled before the container. And we are standing in front of this beautiful model, Justina Mask, which is a general cargo ship from the 1950s. And mm. what is your reason for showing her in your exhibition? The main reason is to show how goods were, goods were handled in the port back in the day, before the, the age of container. Mm. And you can really see that it, it's a, like a jigsaw puzzle. Where they had to fit lots of different shapes, lots of different crates and barrels and bags and piles of stuff mm. into the hull. Mm. And of course, that took, took a long time. So, and that, of course, it had, again, ramifications for the whole port life mm. uh, back 50, 60, 70 years ago. Mm. So it's a quite rare model because you can see inside the hull, which is quite rare for ship models. Mm. And that's also one, not the only reason, but one of the main reasons that we, we love this model so much. Mm. You can really see, you, you get a glimpse of working conditions and uh, how they handled, handled goods back then. Mm. How long would she stay in port on average, do you think? I've heard that it was uh, around 50% of the time yeah. uh, she would be in port and 50% she would be on her way. Mm. That's, of course, completely different than nowadays. Mm. Of course, that also meant that the seafarers they had a lot of time to explore the world because mostly this, the crew, uh, the ship's crew, they did, didn't really participate in the loading and offloading of goods. So they were, had a lot of free time. Mm. They had to inspect the off and unloading, but the work was done by dock workers mostly. Mm. So you see a lot of small dock workers in yeah. the model as well. Um, yeah, a lot of the dock workers, they were hired day by day simply. So mm. they showed up and they asked in the office, is there any work for me today? Mm. And then they said, yeah, Justina Mask arrived and they, you have to unload this. And then they were paid by day mm. uh, or may, maybe even paid by unit. So mm. they, if they could carry 10 units, they were paid 10, 10, 10 amounts of money. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> and if yeah. they carried 11, they would get a bit more. All right. Uh, so that was a kind of pay, pay structure that really um, rewarded you if you were young and strong and healthy. Mm. Uh, so the young and strong and healthy, they loved that kind of uh, wage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. 
there was a lot of life surrounding these uh, these ships when they arrived because yeah. uh, not hundreds maybe but a qu quite a large number of dock workers they would gather in order to to offload yeah. and to unload after of course yeah. and that meant of course there would be a lot of people surrounding the ship yeah. tr trucks and uh, lots of different cranes not these large container cranes, but cranes for assorted kind of goods. Mm. And also a lot of ports back then, they didn't have cranes installed. So the ships, they were carrying the cranes. And you can see that as well on, on this model. Yeah. It was very common back in the day that uh, the the ships, they they often unloaded with the ships. Uh, they had their own gear, right? So they, they, they had their own gear. Port. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Shastina Mask entered the Maersk fleet in 1953 and she was deployed on our Panama line which departed from the United States east coast through the Panama Canal and onwards to call several ports in Southeast Asia. She is named after our founder A.P. Müller's wife Shastine, who was an American from Kansas City, Missouri. They had met each other in St. Petersburg in 1908 and got married in the little town of Mayview just outside Kansas City in 1910. After a long honeymoon in the United States, the newlyweds settled in a small town north of Copenhagen, here in Denmark. And also, uh, the port's very different from today, right? Because though they were usually within the city, so you would get yes. that whole city life as well, right? Yes. Yeah. So it was, now we call the exhibition Gate to the World, mm. it's because it is about un often unloading. Mm. But that's, of course, the main reason for the port. The port's existence, yeah. but the port also develops this life yeah. of saying goodbye to your loved ones, or, or welcoming them home after maybe a year and or two years abroad sailing. Mm -hmm. So the port, back 50, 60 years ago, also had the uh, the role that the airport has nowadays, mm -hmm. um, where there was a lot of international life, but also family families being split apart and families reuniting. Yeah, and then. Also, there was a lot of uh, nightlife because of a lot of young young men, uh, the yeah. crews, they were mostly young men. So yeah. they arrived on these ships and they, they went to town. Yeah. We know that from Copenhagen, Hamburg, Antwerp, all the European yeah. Uh, yeah. big uh, port towns. When you look at the old photo albums, mm. it was also the day before the digital photo. So they have wonderful photo albums and we have quite a lot of them in our collection. Mm. You see that there's lots of photos from the towns, from yeah. the cities, from the, from the bars and the people they met but also the tourist sites yeah. because they will take to touristic tours. Yeah. There are also some photos of the crew on board, but very few from the actual work mm. because people don't tend to f take photos while they work. No. They perceive it as uninteresting and everyday life. And yeah. so they- Of course, uh, but that is what we yeah. find interesting, of yeah. course, to see how they were actually working and living on board also, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 And there's uh, so a lot more crew on board the ship at that time. Yeah, we estimate that around 50 people were on board. Yeah. Most of the, the crew members, they would live uh, down the back on Chastine. Yeah. But that was also quite a new thing in the 50s, because prior to the 50s, most of the decks hands and common sailors, they would live in the very front of the ship. Mm. And that's quite, be quite a harsh place to live, because that's where all the waves, they, course, they hit yeah. the ship. Have um, to have strong sea so, legs, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so that could be quite harsh. And you see a lot of um, memoirs from old sailors to, writing about their experiences what they call in front of the mast and that means you know they they were yeah. living in front of the mast yeah. where the captains and the officers they were living behind the mast now this is of course a different ship but mm. there's still difference in the living conditions on mm. board that we have the common sailors living in the back yeah. and then uh, the officers dwellings here yeah. uh, in the in the central structure, but it started to change in the fifties. Yeah. Uh, different shipping shipping companies, uh, the the unions grow stronger, and the uh, the ideas of the welfare society in, in Denmark at least, and the uh, the more egalitarian mm. worldview spreading in society also spreads into the ship. So things start to change a bit at the time too. So if you think about shipping today, it's such a huge part of our life, our world. Mm. Um, but you don't really see it as you did compared to then, right? No, it has changed totally. Mm. Uh, we, we see it when we go down to the supermarket or any other store, when we order things online, we see shipping, but we don't really acknowledge that it is shipping. Uh, mm. I, I think a lot of people tend to forget. Mm. But it was easier to see back in the 50s because, as we mentioned, the ships, they were 
quite often in the center of the cities. Mm. So if you were just passing the docks or you're passing the bridges, even though you had nothing, you had nothing to do with shipping, you would instantly realize, okay, the goods they come by sea. Yeah. And you maybe you would see on the crate, oh, there's coffee from Brazil or Ethiopia, and oh, that's China from China. Mm. And then you, know, you get you get all these uh, you understood the inter international aspects of yeah. the shipping. And where the goods came from. Yes, you yeah. understood where the goods came yeah. from. Nowadays, they, due to the effectiveness, you might say, of the current system, they more or less just magically appear in the supermarket. Yeah. And, you, and I think it's important for us as a museum, but also shipping companies and the people working in shipping to to make sure that people understand this, but, but try to communicate that this is really important, this is still really important. Yeah. And now our planet is called the Earth, but it is mostly sea and mm. our whole civilization is on. We cannot function without the sea and the transport of the sea. So, so where Sh Shastina Mask is a symbol of the old traditional conventional cargo shipping, now we are gonna move further into your exhibition and see how it is today in Wales, right? As we move further and further into the exhibitions at the Maritime Museum, we pass so many ship models all portraying different kinds of transportation throughout history. Whether it be early merchant sailing ships, steamers, motor vessels, passenger ships, ferries, bulk vessels, tankers, you name it and they have it displayed here. It's a visual representation covering so many big and small technological innovations. So as we arrive at the exhibition covering what global trade looks like today, it is truly staggering to see the change that has happened in shipping since the early 1950s. So now we've moved into the section of your exhibition which deals with modern day shipping. Mm -hmm. We're standing in front of this massive model of our first triple E, Max McKinney Miller. Could you tell me a bit yes. about the story behind this model? Yes, uh, because obviously when we built the, the what I still call the new museum, but as red as it's eight years old now, we of course wanted the model of the state-of-the-art ship mm. and uh, the tri Tripoli series was under construction at the time. So we asked uh, Epi Müller Mask whether if they wanted to donate a model mm. and they uh, fortunately said yes. And then we asked, can we have it in scale 1 to 48? And they said, what? 1 to 48? Because <laughs> that would mean that we'll get an, a model which is 8 meters long. Mm. But fortunately, they also said yes to that. So uh, now we have this eight meter long model. <laughs> and the reason we wanted it in 1 to 48 is that our 18th century models, they are all made in uh, 1 to 48. So you can mm. really see the difference between ships from 200 years ago and the ships of today. So and it's also just impressive for our guests to walk into this room, which in itself is quite large, mm. and then see this huge model. You know, people have never seen a ship model this large before. Yeah. Oh, but you can really see the scale, right? To what global shipping is all about today, right? Yes, it's, yeah. I think for a lot of our visitors, it's a, quite an eye-opener. Yeah. To, of course, a lot of people have heard about these large ships. Some have seen them, but a lot of people have never seen them. And then when they are put next to our old ships, and in this context, people just go, wow, all the goods that I consume, mm. uh, not all of them, because, but of course, but <laughs> many of them, yeah. they travel by sea in containers like these and on ships like this. Yeah. And another thing I really like about this model is that now we talk about the Shastina mask, you can mm. see into her hull, or yeah. you can also see into the hull of this ship. And then you realize that there's not really any difference between the lower part and the upper part no. of the ship. It's just stacked with containers yes. uh, through and through. Yeah. So when uh, on Chestina you have this special cargo on the deck, yeah. but in the age of the container, the, the goods on the deck, they, they've become the norm. Right? Yeah. Of course, this is how container ships look like. Yeah. So the container and this system where you can, f you can fix all the containers so they, they will stay in place. That yeah. also means that you can really um, make the shipping mo much more efficient. Uh, yeah. You can have so much more goods, not just because the ship is larger, but also because you can store it more uh, efficiently. Yeah. Yeah. Our first generation of Triple E was delivered in 2013. With a capacity of 18,000 TEUs, meaning 20-foot equivalent units, the Triple E can carry the equivalent of 144 million pairs of sneakers. The three E's stands for economy of scale, energy efficiency and environmentally improved. They are deployed between Europe and Asia and Maersk has since launched a second generation of Triple E's which has a capacity of around 20,000 TEUs. 
it's very eye-opening to see the difference between a uh, model as Justine, the general cargo ships mm. from the 50s and now this yeah. massive mastodon. And you also, when you see this difference between these ships, you also realize how people living now can have a difficulty understanding what is shipping yeah. doing for me because you cannot see the goods. No, you, of course, intellectually, you know that the goods that I consume, some of them, they're in there, yeah. but you cannot see them, you cannot feel them. The, the economy of scale also means that the, nowadays, some of the most expensive goods you can buy in Denmark, they are made by people living next door. Mm. And some of the cheapest goods you can buy, they're, they're not because they're necessarily bad quality, but they're, they're made in, in Asia. Mm. And it's, back in the 200 years ago, it's completely different. That the, the, the most expensive goods, they were made far, far away. Mm. But now we can actually get these goods from far away quite cheaply, uh, at modest prices, at least, uh, because of the efficiency of the shipping. So yeah. as a consumer, you pay quite little. Yeah, uh, per ne unit. Pay uh, next to nothing yeah. <laughs> for the transport per unit. Yeah. And uh, what you'll pay is for the, the Compared production. Compared to back then. Yeah, yeah. back then the, yeah. the transport was a much larger, larger part of the, yeah. the price with the consumer. Yeah. With the crew, like the number of people on board. So yes. for a mask, you would have 19, 20 people on board. Justine, it would be around maybe 50 people or, yeah. or less. Yeah, and then if we go back to 200 years ago, yeah. there would be like on the big free mastered frigates, there would be maybe around 150 people. Yeah. So of course you had to pay a lot of, yeah. even though the wages they weren't a large, but <laughs> quite large, they were they were small back then. Yeah, yeah. Still, you had to pay uh, wages to 150 crew members yeah. and, instead of 20. Yeah. As our tour of the Maritime Museum comes to an end, it is clear that from the general cargo liners of the 1950s to the massive, massive Triple E's, a lot has happened. The impact of the container can hardly be overstated. This simple steel construction allowed for cargo to be transferred from ships to trains to trucks in just one unit. The intermodal container was introduced in the 1950s and it is estimated that transportation costs were reduced by up to 75% making the container an absolute revolution in terms of facilitating global trade.